The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series. A webinar series featuring military leaders and contemporary military authors. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of Education, Lieutenant General Guy Swan. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Thought Leaders webinar series. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This series has become quite popular over the past year, and we appreciate your participation today, just as we appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our nation. Joining us today, today to discuss his new book is Major General Jeff Schlosser, U.S. Army Retired the author of Marathon War, Leadership in Combat in Afghanistan. For those joining us online today, please take advantage of having General Schlosser here to ask questions. You can use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen to submit a question. And after a brief discussion uh, with General Schlosser, we'll take as many of your questions as time allows. Major General Jeff Schlosser retired from the U.S. Army after 34 years of service. The highlight of his career, I think he would tell you, was his extended 33-month command tour of duty as the commanding general of the 101st uh, Airborne Division, the famous Screaming Eagles. That tour of duty also included a 15-month combat deployment in eastern Afghanistan from early 2008 to mid-2009 which is the period he describes in the book. During his distinguished career, General Schlosser also served in Iraq, Kosovo, Albania, Kuwait, Haiti, Jordan, Korea, and twice in Germany. The book has been well received as evidenced by the many testimonials uh, of a number of prominent leaders, including former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, who said, General Schlosser eloquently and candidly writes about being a senior commander at war, making decisions that likely will result in soldiers wounded and killed, while simultaneously dealing with the political challenges of dealing with higher headquarters and senior echelons of the American, Afghan, and Pakistani governments. General John Campbell, former Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and former top commander in Afghanistan writes, Jeff provides an intimate account of the interpersonal struggles that senior leaders are challenged with in the most complex situations. Leaders in any profession who choose to be relevant need to read this account. And from our very own president here at AUSA, General Carter Ham, the very personal reflections of a most thoughtful senior commander help us better understand the strategic context and consequences of America's longest war but also offers insights into the incredible stories, tragic and heroic, of those involved. Jeff reminds us that while politicians make the big decisions about war, it is soldiers and their families who bear the brunt of those decisions. General Schlosser, Jeff, thanks very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us about your new book. And uh, if you would, please come up and tell us more about Marathon War. Over to you, Jeff. Well, General Swan, thanks for that introduction. And I really do need to thank AUSA and, uh, and General Ham as well for this whole series of thought leaders. Uh, you know, during uh, COVID and, and all these other things that have uh, happened over the last uh, year and a half, uh, the ability to get together and think and, and actually analyze, uh, especially leadership and combat operations, I think is, you know, uh, it hasn't gone by the wayside, but it's been more, more difficult to do. And uh, having a thought leaders webinar like this, I think is absolutely really, really important. So again, thank you, uh, sir, for doing that. Uh, just for a few minutes, what I'd like to do before we get to the questions, which I really am looking forward to, um, is I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, why I wrote the book and what's actually in the book for those of you that have not seen it uh, by uh, yet. And so uh, I always start off with the why, right? I mean, I always in combat, I always try to define uh, why we were doing an operation, why I sought to have something occur uh, on a battlefield that uh, 
other commanders were going to actually execute. And I thought maybe that would allow them to do it in a better way. I didn't want to tell them how, but I wanted to tell them the why. So why did I write Marathon War Combat Leadership in Afghanistan? Um, let me go back and just say that even as a Lieutenant Colonel, I always wanted to record my thoughts. And so starting right before I took over uh, my first battalion, uh, I started writing in my little green army notebooks, government notebooks, uh, my thoughts for the day. And uh, as I say in Marathon War, what I ended up doing is in the evenings, I'd roll those thoughts up and write them down in a you know, coherent way so I could actually read them later on. Um, what I found after I retired in 2010 is, is that these journals, it became, became common knowledge among a few folks that I had these journals and that they were extraordinarily detailed, both on days and what occurred during those days uh, and about who the people were that were in certain meetings. And so these journals covered the time that I was a deputy commander at the National Counterterrorism Center um, or the uh, deputy director. Uh, it also covered times when uh, I was a lead planner for the war on terrorism uh, on the joint staff. And then later as a deputy to uh, General Petraeus in Iraq and later, finally, as a division commander for 33 months and 15 months in Afghanistan. As I reread that portion of Afghanistan, uh, what I basically saw was is that it was very clear that I was making notes about being a tactical commander, the last tactical edge there as a division commander and often as an operational commander. In other words, responsible for uh, regional command east, uh, which was a NATO command. Um, but I also had a large amount of strategic uh, comments in there because I had strategic responsibilities. And I was looking back and I was thinking, gosh, it is a probably uh, something that I had to talk to people about. Uh, you know, there was a, I, I, and I've said this before to other audiences, there were days where I would give advice of the most strategic nature uh, to say Secretary Gates, uh, Admiral Mullen, uh, Clearly, my, my boss is uh, uh, there at CENTCOM, um, General Dempsey first and then General Petraeus, as well as uh, the NATO commander, General McKiernan. And at the same time, I would fly about within an hour, I would fly out and be part of uh, on the ground with a squad or a platoon at the very largest in one of our 100 uh, outposts in, in the regional command east. And we would be talking about you know, soldier things, uh, you know, things that I understood as a private first class as I enlisted in the Army back in 1976, talking about the enemy, talking about uh, what did uh, the future hold, and their idea of the future was a day or two at the most. And then at an evening, I'd fly back and maybe go through a combat update, and then I would, uh, uh, in our uh, Joint Operations Center, and then late at night, I would write uh, uh, letters to uh, the families of the fallen. And then maybe at three o'clock in the morning, we'd actually say goodbye to the fallen in their coffins as we would put them on a waiting C-130 or C-17 and give them honors due what we called the uh, ramp ceremony. And when I rolled that up, it was tactical, it was operational, it was strategic. And I thought, you know, there's something here that I would like to communicate. Um, now, I also want to be truthful with the audience. I say this in the first part of the book, uh, you know, I wrote the book, probably I finished the book. You start a book for one reason, you maybe finish it for another, but I had the guts to finish it for very selfish reasons. Uh, you know, I felt it was actually a, a catharsis. I was, uh, as I went through my journals, I, I actually discovered things that I had tried to forget. How's that? Uh, either about the harshness of combat, how hard it was. There were times when I was, just felt like my spirit was being torn. Uh, I was doubting myself sometimes, doubting a war. And uh, I wanted to delay that in the book uh, that people would understand. And I think most people know I'm not an author uh, by trade, and uh, nor am I a historian, as the, all the historians out there that uh, may have had a chance to read the book, and I know there's been several. Um, but I, what I was, as I was a soldier. So that's why I wrote the book. So what's it about? Uh, as uh, General Swan said, you know, I was privileged to lead the 101st Airborne Division for 33 months. Uh, it's I know that I am not the longest serving commander that is held by uh, the chief of staff of the army, uh, General Jim McC uh, McConville, a, a good friend. Uh, but I did serve 15 months straight in combat in Afghanistan. And I'm not sure if that's the record. I'm not trying to hold a record, but it was a lengthy period of time. We knew that from the start. And so the book talks about the preparation of a division going into combat. Half of it's going to be split. Part of it's going to go to Iraq. 
the part that I led with the staff and uh, one of the BCTs and our complete, all of our aviation, the both aviation brigades and our sustainment brigade, we were gonna be augmented by other brigades that uh, we had not trained with uh, over time. And so it's about the preparation and then it is all about what happens in combat for the next 15 months. Um, again, it covers those three levels uh, in ways, you know, tactical. I try not to delve into too much of the tactical parts, but I do go into some parts uh, of certain battles at a great level of detail uh, because I think they help tell the rest of the story about the operational and strategic decisions uh, that a guy like me had to make. Uh, or at least I had to advise at the strategic level. Let's not say that I don't make strategic decisions, but I had to advise the, the National Command Authority and those that worked uh, for him at the time. Um, so it's all that, but it's also this deeply personal feeling. And I was being very honest as I wrote to, you know, wrote this book um, about taking responsibility for things that I knew that I had messed up in war. And that's always possible and people die because of that. Um, and also, what is the impact, you know, on families? You know, so I write in a book, I write in a marathon war that, uh, you know, uh, you, a soldier can go to war, but they're never going to come back the same. And the truth is, is when a family stays back and, and a soldier goes to war, and it could be a Marine, an airman, a sailor, um, they too are changed. Uh, and especially when you go away for, say, 15 months. And then prior to that, of course, there was extensive train up. And so essentially I was gone for about 25 to 30 months from my family. Um, it has an impact. And I want to talk about that. I do talk about that in the book um, in a way that I think is very personal, not very, not personal, but very personal and, and very truthful. Um, people have asked me, you know, especially given the last I'd say the last couple of weeks, uh, several weeks, months, uh, situation in Afghanistan. Is there anything we can learn by reading your book that will help us understand what's happened in Afghanistan? And I think there is. Um, in the book, you're going to see that that I have an inkling uh, after uh, basically hosting a, a group of uh, senior leaders to come to the division and talk to us before we deploy. I'll never forget uh, at the time Brigadier General uh, John Mick, uh, Mick Nicholson came in and he talked about corruption and thievery and uh, he laid it out for us in ways that I had just not seen. And I, I, I write in a book, I started to think about, I have not gone to school on what he's even talking about as far as the corruption that seems to be endemic in a culture uh, like Afghanistan and what will it mean for us as we are trying to do the things that we set out to do, our mission. And that comes back throughout the 15 months we are there in combat. I talk about it towards the end about as I kind of lay out what is the future for Afghanistan and the U.S. role there, uh, that critical piece about uh, corruption. Uh, it, comes to, it comes in there in totally, uh, it's interesting ways. It happens in, in a tactical situation that the battle will not, you know, where basically the, the people disappear. Um, uh, the national police, the local police, basically, they disappear. Uh, and I'm left scratching my head about, was this because we didn't understand the people? Yes. Uh, was it because they were bribed and, and told to leave? Potentially, yes, as well. But it's, it impacted us at the tactical level and impacts us at the strategic level as well. Um, the various things that we talked about, um, at strategic and operational and tactical level. I want to give a couple highlights about what I mean. Um, so strategic, basically, many noted uh, military commanders before me have noted that uh, the higher you get, it all becomes about the, uh, the battle for uh, logistics and really the battle for resources. And throughout the book, you're going to see, uh, if you have not read it, but I'm constantly talking about uh, the need uh, for more resources, given the mission that we've been given. Uh, I don't take the opposite track and say, you know what, I can't do my mission. I'm going to try to lower what I've been told to do. Instead, what you see is me trying to, at my level, division commanders start to ask for significantly more resources. This is occurring during a time when there's the Iraqi surge. Uh, I'm told by my own bosses, don't ask for more troops. You're not going to get them anyway. Um, uh, and I felt that uh, it was my role as a commander and I, I needed to have the moral courage to stand up and ask for what I needed. And I did so. Uh, and the, some of the uncomfortable discussions we've had that involved the Secretary of Defense as well as 
uh, the chairman and others are related in that book. But that's clearly a strategic uh, issue that goes throughout this entire book. And where I actually turn and decide that I'm going to bet my stars. In other words, it's not happening the way things are I had hoped. Um, and I've actually figured that I'm going to go public with the idea that we need more resources uh, in Afghanistan. Otherwise, we're not going to win on a pace that America will ever stand. And uh, potentially, they may actually say something about today. Uh, operational. Uh, you know, one of the things that comes out throughout this is, is that uh, we, as we go in, we are actually training for the new counterinsurgency doctrine. And... Uh, and part of that doctrine is, is to actually insert our soldiers, Marines, uh, airmen who are PRT commanders and serving in PRTs as well as sailors, uh, right smack in the middle of a village, right with the people. Um, and yet there's this huge friction that I feel each and every day. Because um, that, that means is you're basically, you have to decentralize in a way. We had literally at one point had 101. I can't make this up, Swan. Uh, you know, 101, 101. 101. People think I fake that, but it's true. We had 101 combat outposts. Many of them were squad level to maybe an augmented squad, 15 people at the most, soldiers out there. They were with the people in the villages, or they were right smack on a rat line. Uh, and there's this really interesting friction between what the, the doctrine said to do and then what we're trying to do and then what the people really are not comfortable with. You know, I mean, that really didn't fit into basically the Afghan culture. And so throughout this, you're seeing friction. Sometimes it's combat uh, at its worst or its, or its most challenging, such as the Battle of Lanat uh, or ba the Battle of Bari Alai. Uh, and uh, again, I count those in there, but it's a clearly very much operational. Uh, tactical. So I try to keep the tactical, as I've said already, a little bit limited um, to the point where it actually has lessons that we can be beyond the tactical portion. Um, I'm a big believer that uh, the best tactical writing in the world is done by somebody that actually pulled the trigger uh, in combat. Most division commanders shouldn't be doing that, at least in my opinion. That's you know, well, it's not something that uh, we're being paid to do. Um, but it does, I take a whole chapter and take apart the, the battle of one not because I think there's so many lessons that would be learned. Uh, there's a significant amount involved in uh, this battle called Bar Alai uh, towards the end of our tour. Uh, there's also a part that occurs uh, in Goro Preo, which is a fascinating uh, 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 battle. Unfortunately, I could only account for part of it because uh, the defense publication system uh, did not, they said it was mainly classified and I had to eliminate a good part about it. But what it did show, uh, was the impact on the Pakistani border uh, with Afghanistan and our lack of understanding of what actually was occurring there. Yeah. And then basically also demonstrates uh, uh, the capabilities of a division commander in combat in Afghanistan to actually take the fight to the enemy, as, even as they're retreating into a what uh, has been deemed a safe haven. So strategic, operational, tactical, I try to put them all inside there. I've been asked also about the interactions with key leaders. And, you know, some people have accused me of writing a who's who. Um, the truth is, is that these were all commanders that were, you know, either my peers or worked for me or I worked for them. I mean, uh, when I look backwards, you know, uh, right now, Generals Milley, McConville, Townsend, uh, General Holmes, Mobile Holmes, ACC Commander, Air Force, uh, and General Andrzejczyk, who is the Chief of uh, Defense uh, in Poland, uh, all four stars. Um, General James, Jim Richardson, uh, Scott Spellman, Ron Lewis, Mike Howard, Pete Johnson, Hank Taylor, Larry Harrington, Paul Crandall, Paul Bontrager, uh, General Lenin, uh, French uh, forces. Um, what I would say about that is, is that Afghanistan drew, I will say, you know, it, it drew great teams. And these teams were made up of leaders uh, that led these teams. And I was really privileged to work with all of these folks. Uh, I personally believe if you ask them, if you ask the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, General McConville at this point in time, if you ask what was, you know, really important in your development as a leader, that they would say one of the milestones was a deployment to Afghanistan. Um, and they may actually even say, hey, it was, you know, part of that was uh, this deployment specifically in 2008 and 2009, where we're literally fighting a very coherent and uh, very well organized enemy. Um, 
Finally, just in closing off my comments, you know, the book is about Afghanistan as it uses the concepts, um, or not concepts, but my lessons in, uh, of Afghanistan, but it's also really a book about leadership. Um, it, it takes a hard look at all these previous leaders plus others that are involved with uh, over there, foreign leaders, either they're Pakistani or Afghan, uh, Polish leaders, uh, French, many, many others. Um, but through the eye, the kind of the lens of what is important to be a really good leader. Uh, in some cases, I identify those that are not really good leaders. Uh, they're lacking in certain things, and it makes it really a challenge either to follow them or to be in sync with them, or in many cases to go into combat after you know they've done certain things. When I distilled it all down, and, and there are so many great attributes of being a good leader that it actually becomes like a dictionary and it's not useful for many of us that study still leadership, whether we're still in the military, still in business or whatever we're doing, or retired and just thinking about it and writing about it. I just stood it down to three things and, and their competence. And it's not just competence, personal competence of a leader, but it's also surrounding yourself with competence. So you, you really have got to have that in tough situations, whether it's in combat or could be in COVID. Um, but you, and then you've got to be almost, I'll call it ruthless in weeding out the lack of uh, people that are not competent. Um, uh, I, you have to understand, I talk about this and a, a lot about preparation for combat. You, it's on a leader to prepare your people to, to be competent. So you own it, either which way, whether, you know, no matter how it turns out. The next thing is courage, but it's not bravery on a battlefield. So bravery on the battlefield is something, you know, believe it or not, we find bravery in the United States all the time or throughout the world. You see it in first responders, you see it, uh, um, you know, a whole variety of different folks that are willing, uh, you know, to give their life for others. Uh, but I'm talking about moral courage, which is the ability to stand up and bet, I call it bet my stars, but it's bet your bars if you're a young, younger, if you're a warrant officer or, or a, uh, a captain or a lieutenant. But it could be it could be bars for sergeants and everything like that because everybody has to have these critical decisions. But it's the moral courage to stand up for what's right, and do the right thing, even when people are saying don't do that, or, it's not that's too hard, or somebody might even get killed for it. Uh, it's really really hard. Uh, Mark Twain said it's it's incredible in this world that you see so much courage out there, but you see so little moral courage in in the world. And then finally, character. And, uh, you know, character is absolutely, it takes me probably about 20 minutes to define character. I could. Um, but uh, that was probably the single most important thing that I, I think a lead, good leader needed to have. And it was the ability to go for and not, even if you were not being watched, if it was totally non attributable to you and do the hard thing the right way at the right time. And Joe Swan, with that, I think I'll go ahead and stop, yeah. wait for some questions. Hopefully we'll get some yep. good ones. Yep. Very good, Jeff. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, let me, uh, first of all, Jeff, thank you. Uh, I, I personally have been a longtime admirer and uh, before you were even division commander. So this is a real privilege and I appreciate it. Um, let me just go back to one of the things you talked about, the levels of responsibility. Um, as you stated, normally a division commander would operate at the tactical operational level. You found, probably quite unusually, yourself operating at the strategic level. Now, after you, the division, left Afghanistan, there was a change of command at the ISAF yes. level. General McChrystal came in, replaced General uh, McKiernan, and General Rodriguez came in as a three-star commander. You didn't have that level of command to you, so you were reporting directly to General McKiernan. Did, how much of that do you think distracted you from your duties as a division commander, and did bringing in the three-star headquarters help alleviate that? Yeah, so that's a great question, Oswan. And so just to clarify, so um, when we went in there, and, and this had been the same situation for General Rodriguez uh, commanding CJTF-82, uh, who was our immediate predecessor, um, what 
um, my role was is I was basically triple head. And so I, I commanded the CJTF, you know, the division that was the, the, the combined joint task force uh, headquarters. And it was clearly joint, very much combined. Um, at the same time, I was a NATO commander for RC East. And so, and so was my predecessor, um, which had very defined duties under NATO. And I was reporting to my NATO boss, who was General McKiernan, who at the time, while he was clearly the senior U.S. Army officer in country, right. uh, he did not have a title that he was not commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan at the time. Um, my role also in, um, in, included being the national support element for forces of Afghanistan. And so I would find times when I was actually flying to Farah or Herat or other places of that nature to try to make sure that these small bands of U.S. Uh, forces were being properly taken care of. It's very clear to me about, and it's probably midway in the book, in the Battle of Sarobi, uh, where the French forces, we don't know what's happening exactly. We have to come in and basically really help reinforce them at, at, at a period of time. And I find out that not only did I not know about it as an immediately adjacent commander, but neither did ISAF headquarters. General McKernan had no idea that they were going to do this kind of a force on force uh, uh, movement deep into a what we knew was going to be a pit, a, a den of, of Taliban. And it became after that, it became very clear to me that I needed to do everything I possibly could to talk about support General McKernan because he saw that, that there was no layer between his RC commanders, like I was one, um, and um, uh, and his own staff, which was essentially a strategic staff. There was NATO staff who had not been war fighters. Yeah, yeah. I, the reason I asked that, you know, because at, at the time you were commanding, I was over in Iraq, and I would see you on some of the the uh, video conferences with Central Command, and and it seemed like, and the book kind of reflected it. You spent a lot of time on resourcing. Uh, from start to finish in that tour uh, in Afghanistan, trying to get more resources. This was a time when the surge had nominally been completed, but the forces in Iraq were there. And and it just seemed that out of sorts that a division commander would be fighting for those theater assets like ISR and right. other things. So uh, I, I just wanted to draw that out from you. Yeah, and, I, and to answer the, fully answer your first question, John Swan, I mean, I think that when, when in fact, after we leave, they stand up a three-star headquarters, General Rodriguez goes in there, uh, General McChrystal comes in as the commander. I, I do think that that three-star headquarters as a war fighting, uh, operational war fighting headquarters, I think does add significantly uh, to the fight and then frees up the people that followed after me, which was General Scaparotti, uh, General John Campbell, um, the chief of staff of the army, General McCombell, it allows them to do more of what I think a division commander normally would do. Yeah, you know, at the time, yeah. and what was needed to be done. Absolutely, yeah. That that was that was tough. I I watched that from a distance, but I saw that. Um, on the character piece, um, you know, I, I think your uh, assessment of leadership attributes. Uh, character or character candor and uh, character courage and competence um you had to relieve a number of people during yeah. your command tour um that doesn't happen a lot in our army today um how did you deal with that and this wasn't yeah. this wasn't just commanders it was staff officers and others but was that difficult for you to do? Extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, I, I try to be a person of character. I, you know, I always write in the book in Marathon War that I think, you know, every, you build yourself as a leader over time. And so you're not born with character. And so I, I always try to basically model, you know, right kind of character. And so I always felt like I was accountable uh, and responsible for every leader and staff officer out there, right? Yeah. In many cases, I had appointed them or I'd accept, I had accepted them as commanders coming in and in some cases helped train them. Uh, and so it basically it felt like it was ripping your heart out at the time. Uh, and I bl first and foremost, I blamed myself. I didn't blame them. Um, but given the situation in combat, my belief is, is because people can die for bad decisions and they can die because somebody's not competent. Right. Um, and and it, that's not acceptable. Um, and so I was ruthless. And I and I, you know, I've said it before. Um, once I identified that I thought somebody was incompetent and it could take days, uh, in some cases it took literally uh, about an hour. There's one case where I fly in 
uh, to look at a site with my uh, Sergeant Major Command, Sergeant Major Vince Camacho. He goes one way and I go another way, just as we always did. Um, and this is a platoon outpost. And we came back within about 45 minutes and we looked at each other in the eyes. And I, I pulled the platoon leader, platoon sergeant, and both squad leaders. And I said, I'm relieving you on the spot. I'm taking command. Sergeant Major's are here with me. Uh, my Blackhawk is coming in to take you back to your uh, uh, your headquarters. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we sat like calm to my jock and said, uh, tell the battalion commander I'm in command here until he gets somebody else out here. That I know sent a ripple effect throughout the, the command that is hard to, uh, it's really challenging. But I felt like I, I owed it to the remaining soldiers on the ground. I owed it to our mission because I f felt like they could not defend that count, that outpost yeah, against yeah. the Taliban attack. Um, and uh, I was, but at the end of the day, I was personally embarrassed. I talk about it in the book. Um, it's not embarrassed is the right word. I was ashamed in a sense that I had not caught this earlier. And my real job was, is that I should have trained them better. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know the feeling. You, you, and just to go a little further on that, tell us the story about the young captain that yeah. you relieved who you also had to give a general officer reprimand to. Yeah, you know, actually, I use this story because it, uh, about moral courage, and it's going to seem very crazy for the viewer if you haven't read the book. Um, but the short end of this is, is that I had one of my very best company commanders in a very tough place with not a lot of support. In, in fact, very little support from, uh, you know, the battalion and brigade above him. Uh, I would often go there uh, and see him. I got a report and it was an investigation that was done that... Uh, um, he had troops that were uh, actually being killed by an insider threat. He and his first sergeant decided to deal with it in a very difficult and challenging way. He actually rounded up a whole group of folks that he thought were uh, uh, potentially insider threat, Taliban inside of his camp, and then staged a mock, uh, mock assassination or a mock, uh, mock um, uh, killing. In other words, he'd rough them up a little bit, and then he'd take out one and say, okay, you're it. And uh, all the other would be inside there, the rest of them. And he would uh, actually discharge his nine mil under the ground and send that uh, 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 detainee away to a safe place and then walk back in with his we weapon and go, OK, who's next? That's a paraphrase of uh, essentially what was happening. Um, what came to me was essentially uh, my choice was, you know, uh, to not adjudicate this or not to mitigate it. I basically gave him a choice. I said, uh, you know, Captain, I want you to tell me that what you did was illegal, was unlawful, and was very poor leadership. And, you know, he looked me in the eye, he thought about it for a little bit, and then he goes, sir, I can't do that. He said, I, I believe I was protecting my soldiers. I was standing up for what is right. I know you would do the same thing if you were responsible for just a handful of soldiers out there. And I can't tell you that. And I I signed the Gomar and he uh, left the army within one year. I filed it in, of course, into the Department of the Army level. Throughout the rest of the time I'm in Afghanistan, I'm confronted with all these other moral courage challenges, but I keep going back to that, that captain and go, you know, he stood up for what it was right. It was a brutal war. We were fighting partly with our hands tied behind our back, whereas the enemy was, was doing everything he could to amputate those hands and was and doing things like, you know, brutal, brutal things. And it kept going back to the final. I go, you know, the captain was wrong about his choice. Right. But he had the moral courage to tell me that he thought he was protecting his soldiers and it was the right thing to do at that point in time in combat. And I and it's a good example. Yeah, it's of kind of an interesting way to look at courage. From it, the, it is a I very mean, challenging way. Yeah, I mean, most of us think about bravery way. on the battlefield. Yeah, you know? yeah. You wrote, um, like many senior leaders, speaking to journalists was not in my comfort zone. But I also knew it was a critical responsibility that I had to embrace and improve, improve upon. It seemed like throughout the book you were engaging not just with journalists, but senior government officials up to the president of the United yes. States and the president of uh, Afghanistan. Did, did you get better as a communicator during your time? And, and, and what's the role of communication uh, yeah. as you see it? You know, I'm not sure, General Swan, it's a great question. I, you know, I felt more comfortable, but I wasn't sure if I was actually better in articulating yeah. it. Um, um, what I will say is, is that I did have a message that was honed over a period of time. Um, but I, I very much understood that everybody from either the president all the way on down uh, 
to you know a um, the Speaker of the House or to you know say a journalist, the very best person to be talking to those people were privates and soldiers and sergeants, uh, young warrant officers, and uh, so we would try to create that uh, you know uh, ability. I I spent. I would say 80% of my time in combat, in spite of fighting for resources in the middle of the night and stuff like that, I spent about 80% of my time in my outposts. Uh, and then right. I would come back and tell my staff, or I'd take a staff officer out there and, and then we'd come on back. But I spent it throughout all those 101 outposts, uh, as well as some other places in Afghanistan because of my national support element. Um, I would take a journalist with us. I'll never forget taking Barbara Starr up to the top of a place. Uh, we couldn't go into one of them because we were being mortared. So I just deviated down 10 miles and we were in the frontier. It had just been attacked the day prior. And uh, but Barbara Starr's got, hopefully she's not listening, but she's got a helmet askew. We climbed to the top of this uh, out, outpost and we're looking into Pakistan frontier. And there's a young sergeant there talking with her and I'm in the background and stuff like that. And I think that that was the way that I thought we could best communicate what was really happening yeah. on the ground. And I, I regard it as my my duty. Not only did I, should I communicate directly to the, the Congress when they came in a truthful way, it was my duty to do the same thing to journalists. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was amazing, having to communicate from the soldier level right up to the national level, not the normal role for a division commander in, in Congress. Well, let me just tell one, one little war story that's true, that is that when uh, President Bush came for his final time in December of 2008, uh, we had about 30 minutes before he could take off and uh, to go see the President Karzai, and he sat down, he, he asked Steve Hadley, he said, he didn't ask, he said Steve Hadley and, and, and General Dave McKernan was there, and, he, and they were going to huddle, and he goes, no, no, you guys go away, I just want to talk to Jeff. For 30 minutes, he listened, he didn't grill me, he listened, he just, all he said was, Jeff, tell me what's really happening on the ground. And that ability to listen is also extraordinarily important, and no matter how senior you get, so. Wow. Well, let me let me have, ask one more question here, and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, you don't talk directly about it in the book, but we mentioned it earlier before we started about mentorship, uh, a, a key element of leadership. Um, who were some of the mentors that brought you up, and who were? I think it's heartwarming and and rewarding to see the people you mentored. Many you of you meant you mentioned earlier that have uh, moved to greater uh, levels of responsibility. How do you see mentorship? Well, you know, I think, you know, it's, I made a mistake when I first became a division commander, and this is something um, that it took a while for me to learn. I thought that I could mentor just about everybody. And so we had 54, uh, in the 101st, we were, we were a very large division with eight brigades, uh, one in Fort Lee, but I had 54 um, battalions, uh, including our separates. And for every battalion commander, they all changed out after I changed out. Yeah. 100%. You know the you know, yep. you know how it is, John Swan. Uh, and I took the time to try to do mentoring for each and every one. In other words, introductory hour, sitting down, talking, listening, you know, talking about life, talking about families, talking about their previous experiences in combat, if they had any. But it, it, was, it proved to be impossible. Um, and I had to kind of go back and go, you know, who, who are my mentors and how did they do this? And, and I found out that I, I think most really good mentors, they want to devote enough time and they listen to you and then they re-engage over a period of time, right? And so you've got to prioritize those. And, and it, that sounds heartless, but I mean, not everybody can be mentored in the way that will really be, be uh, helpful. You know, you asked about who on the line. I mean, the first one that AUSA knows most was, was uh, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Ted Stroop. Uh, he was my first real battalion commander as a, I was a lieutenant uh, in Germany. And uh, uh, he was probably the first and probably the best one to, because otherwise I would not have been in the Army and I wouldn't have met any of the others uh, because yeah. I was going to get out of the Army. I mean, yeah. there was no doubt that uh, uh, the Army was not for me. And uh and General Stroop uh, gave me some alternatives, and here I am. Uh, but the group after that, uh, General Max Thurman, uh, uh, General Stroop worked for him. Uh, you know, General Thurman had me go into a, an interesting program in which he said, uh, by the way, I want you to be like this guy, Major John Abizade. And so Abizade, General Abizade, becomes a, a significant mentor for yeah. 30 of my years in, 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 uh, in Army. Uh, General Doug Brown, former uh, SOCOM commander, uh, Ambassador Lieutenant General uh, Del Daly, uh, General Dick Coveney, General George Casey, um, 
many of those cases were like 10 o'clock at night when we we're both on the joint staff and he's my boss and we're doing the war on terrorism. But uh, it was, uh, General Casey was a huge mentor. Uh, Dave Petraeus, obviously, I was his deputy commander in combat. Uh, General J.D. Thurman, General David McKiernan, um, untold number of warrant officers, given that yeah, I was an aviator, oh, yeah. um, just so many. Uh, and then there were three critical command sergeants major. One, Donnie Calvary, who was my sergeant major for both of the battalions I commanded. Frank Gerpe, as I went into the 101st, and he's almost ready to leave soon thereafter, but he's combat experienced in, in the theater that I'm sending a lot of troops to, and a great friend. And then Vince Cam Camacho, my battle buddy. And finally, these guys were peers, although they aren't anymore. But uh, Stan McChrystal and I were at Harvard together. You know the school well. Yeah. Uh, Bill McRaven and I worked on, uh, uh, he was on the White House, and I was uh, at the War and Terrorism Center. And then uh, Colonel Al Roberson. Roberson uh, and I are, have been long friends, but there are peers out there that are better mentors than even some of the senior folks out there. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a real you know, testament to those relationships that uh, we we cherish in, in our yeah. careers. So thanks for that. There's a good question here. You spent a lot of time in the Middle East uh, in outside of your, your command tour. And there's a good question here. As a foreign area officer, you had greater appreciation of the region than most senior commanders, yet you still had difficulty understanding the people, corruption, et cetera. How can we better prepare our future leaders for this challenge? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, and just kind of go back, you know, I talk about uh, the role of General Thurman. General Thurman had, Max Thurman had this idea that uh, we needed people to be trained as foreign area officers and army strategists and have those skill sets, even if they didn't serve one day as a FAO uh, or one day as a strategist, because he felt that they would be better at combat. And he, he foresaw uh, Southwest Asia and the least conflict yeah. coming, right? Uh, so I got to say that I had years of preparation, a year of Arabic, uh, two years at Georgetown uh, and things like that, and then serving throughout the Middle East uh, in a variety of different positions. How do we get better at it? Well, one, we have to understand, we have this, this cultural hubris when we go into a place and I had it in Afghanistan as being sensitive as I was, is that I thought I could understand uh, things I could I could translate it into a Western way of thinking. And, and in fact, that's not always the case. Um, and so we need to understand, first and foremost, that many environments in which we're going to have to serve, the culture there is very different than ours. It's not alien. It's not weird. It's not wacko. It is just very different. And we need to go immediately to school on, on the culture of the people because the people tend to be everything. Either they're your enemy or they're the people you're trying to protect. And uh, the culture is absolutely critical. I'll, I'll just, uh, I don't want to go long, but in Nuristan, which is in this Northern part of, uh, of our sector in, in regional command East, it is a very uh, inclusive, uh, you know, uh, they hate outsiders up there and things like that. And it, I literally was calling the CIA and the State Department saying, who are your experts on Nuristan? And if there was one in each. And I said, you need to help wow. me understand what's wow. going on because I no longer can understand what the situation is yeah. up in Nuristan. So that's a great question. It's yeah. always a challenge, but I'm always convinced that uh, our FAOs uh, really add a huge, huge amount to uh, any kind of uh, uh, conflict, uh, both going in and then resolving it. Uh, we can't uh, we can't conclude without uh, a, a question about current events. And sure. you've been doing a lot of uh, interviews and things over the last uh, several weeks as we watch things unfold in Afghanistan. And there is a question here: Can you please evaluate the short and long uh, implications of the failed withdrawal from Afghanistan, as well as the impact on the morale of U.S. military forces? Probably a, a bit of a, maybe a little unfair question, but what are your thoughts of what well, you've seen here? Yeah, I think I mean, right now most American citizens and clearly those in the profession of arms is focus, we're focused on the tactical portion of this. This is the withdrawal. It looks like it's you know too hasty or not well planned and things of that nature. And there clearly are implications. We're going to have to work through getting our American citizens out of there. Uh, we're going to have to clearly... Uh, try to get the translators and their families that actually have a status with the American Army or Marines or others out of there and also help all of the NATO allies do that. That's very tactical. Um, we need to, though, focus on the strategic portions of this. The strategic thing is, is Afghanistan to the west is bordered by 
Iran, to the north by the former central stands, the, uh, you know, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. It has a border with China, has a border with the nuclear arm Pakistan, and then to the south uh, is the free flow of oil or the non-free flow of oil. And uh, we have got to understand that um, the situation's not going to get better. Uh, think about a disorder there that is hugely important. We've got an armed Taliban that's very capable mm -hmm. as a regional army. Uh, they do not share anything uh, that we basically would think of as a normal society. And unfortunately, you have a safe haven for Al Qaeda. And yeah. uh, so those are strategic things. I, I would wish we would focus more on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the story is not yet finished in Afghanistan, I'm yeah. sure. Just the next chapter. <laughs> Just the next chapter. Yeah. Let, let me uh, let me close here, General Slosser, with a, uh, an observation. Uh, uh, for those that have read the book and those who will read the book, uh, you'll notice that uh, the author starts each chapter with a, a famous quote or a quote from uh, some prominent individual in history. And uh, I wanted to ask you if you had a favorite one of those quotes in the book. Yeah, I absolutely do. And, and most of you are going to be uh, astounded by this, but it's uh, Genghis Khan. And so Genghis Khan basically goes in in 1221 and invades uh, Afghanistan and does what he does best, which is uh, basically brutally murders most folks. Uh, but what he found challenging was the after. And uh, so this quote basically is, is, he basically said, it's easy to uh, conquer the world on horseback. It's much more difficult to govern the world once you get off the horse. And that is exactly what I think we found. That's what others have found in Afghanistan. And it's clearly what the Taliban are going to find as they go forward. Yeah. Wow. Very, what, 1219 from 1219, <laughs> 1219 to 1221 <laughs> to 2021. Yeah. Well, General Schlosser, thank you very much for spending time with us. More importantly, thank you for the book. And, and if you haven't read this book yet, uh, please do. It, it's not it is very much a memoir of a commander in combat, but the lessons of leadership really jump out at you. And uh, General Slosser really takes advantage of his experiences to, to share those uh, leadership lessons. So thank you, Jeff, for doing yeah. that. Sir, thanks for hosting this. And again, yep. thanks to AUSA. Thank you. Well, folks, uh, that's all the time we have today, but I wanted to apprise you of some upcoming events uh, here at AUSA on the 21st of September. Uh, in uh, recognition of Suicide Prevention Month of September, uh, we'll be hosting a thought leaders webinar with Dr. James Hellis on suicide prevention and awareness. Uh, on the 16th of November, we'll be back again for another thought leaders webinar in the Company of Heroes. Uh, and that is by author James uh, Kitfield. And I think you'll enjoy that one very much. Don't forget, 11 to 13 October, downtown at the Washington uh, DC Convention Center. We are back in person for the 2021 AUSA Annual Meeting and Exposition. I know you've all been waiting uh, for this event to return and we're very excited to bring that to you. Uh, registration is now open. Get online and uh, get your registration in as soon as possible. Uh, it's going to be a great event. We're very excited to be back again. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us uh, once again for the AUSA Thought Leaders webinar and have a great Army Day.